Hello. Hello, is Dennis there? Is this Dustin? It is. How you doing? Good. I'm good, thanks. We, we're on track today. Okay. Thanks uh, so You're much for... the heat then, huh? A yeah. Bit. Well, beating something, yeah. <laughs> At any... Well, speaking of beating something, I'm here with my co-host, Ton. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Ton, hey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm good. Hanging in there. So you guys uh, got all the bugs out of the equipment then. We got we got a different studio we're calling you from, but it's all we're ready to ready to rock as long as you are. Okay, well, you know, I I deal with uh equipment all the time myself, so I can uh, understand what you go through. It's it's a rough rough business here. <laughs> the heat knocked us off and then we had to make some uh, plan Bs and Cs, so uh, the last time I had a, a heat-related uh, failure was uh, playing uh, in, out in front of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with uh, Neil Smith and Joe Bouchard, and it was a really brutally hot day, and the half of the PA decided that it, wasn't, it was too hot to work. <laughs> wow. Wow. What a time to, to Yeah, fail. that's that's a little more high scale than uh, our problems here. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, okay, good. So you guys are in Minnesota. Yep, yep. All right, cool. So you mind if we ask you a few questions? Not at all. All right, sounds good. Shoot. Well, we'll ask you about uh, the early days. You guys had a few name changes, and then you decided on the name Alice Cooper. Uh, can you give us, like, maybe an abridged version of that story? Well, it had to do with uh, other bands coming up with our names. We were called the Spiders, and then a Japanese band called the Spiders released an album, and in those days it was uh, commonly understood that if you got an album, then the name was yours. So then we tried to think of something that nobody else would have, and we came up with the NAS, and we were building that regionally in the Southwest. And then... uh, the band with Todd Rundgren out of Philadelphia called the Naz got an album. So then we decided we really had to come up with something that nobody else would uh, think of. And uh, Alice thought of uh, Alice Cooper was just a name that popped into his head because he was thinking like Lizzie Borden or, you know, that kind of a very innocent little girl who has a hatchet behind her back, bad yeah. seed kind of thing. And uh, we had a, we were shooting out a thousand names uh, a day at that point, and and so we bypassed it. We thought, well, I don't know if we're ready for that. But then I went home and ran it past my parents, and the look of shock on their face sold me. <laughs> <laughs> That's our name. <laughs> so with the name and uh, and the stage setup and stuff that you had, what was the reaction from the crowd? Was it a lot of people were freaked out about it, or? Yeah, uh, we were we were in L.A. at the time, and, well, the very first gig, I'm not sure anybody was freaked out because I don't think many people cared who we were. We were the opening band for uh, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and then Blue <laughs> Cheer, and Blue wow. Cheer is who people had come to see, mostly. So we announced, you know, to the uncaring crowd that our, our name had changed that day to Alice Cooper, uh, but... Generally, uh, it it did freak people out. Uh, it actually got us a lot of gigs from promoters who thought they were hiring a a. They just assumed it was a female folk singer. So we would show up and they go, "Oh no, oh no," <laughs> because we That's looked awesome. a little bit different than the other bands at the time. And and we would always promise that we did a toned down show. And of course, we were lying. <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, we did a lot of gigs uh, that the promoter really didn't want to pay us when we got done. <laughs> oh, that's nice. great. How did you guys kind of gravitate into using more theatrics and, and kind of tr- evolving it? Well, the the very first gig we ever did before we even learned how to play our instruments other than Glenn Buxton uh, was theatrical. We wore beetle wigs, and we dressed in uh, sports outfits, and we changed the names to Beatles songs to be sports-oriented. <laughs> and we did, a, we did a show that was pretty theatrical for that era. And then the very first uh, Halloween dance in 1964 at our high school, uh, we had coffins, and we had a guy in makeup 
dressed up like a ghoul. We had a working guillotine. We had spider webs. And so it was from the very beginning we were doing theatrics. Then we became uh, the house band at a local popular club in Phoenix, Arizona called the VIP. The owner, Jack Curtis, hired us, and uh, we had the spider sanctum, and we had cobwebs in front of us, and we all wore black, and we had our own stage that uh, would be dark while the other bands were on their stage, like the Birds and uh, Buffalo Springfield and uh, all kinds of great up-and-coming bands of that era. But then when they were done playing, then at the other end of the room, this spider sanctum would come to life. <laughs> and we, had, we did different theatrics every night because uh, one reason is because the, uh, the VIP club would change bands about every three weeks or so, maybe a month, and then they'd get a new band because they always wanted to have the new flavor. And so I, I thought going in, hey, let's try to avoid that. Let's just change our show so radically all the time that, uh, that we'll be the new band. You know, a month from now we'll be a completely different band than we, than we were. So we started uh, incorporating everything we could get our hands on. Uh, we didn't have any money, so we would just grab things from the back room and come out and incorporate it into the set. And each weekend we had to come up with something different. And then, and then it escalated. We had to keep out doing ourselves, and so we started doing something every set each weekend, which meant we had to do something different, come up with something new four times a weekend. Uh, and we would, I mean, we would just come out with toilet paper, and Alice would be wrapped up like a mummy, and then we'd throw toilet paper into the audience and <laughs> stuff like that, you know. And then the next set, we'd come out with a fork, plastic fork stuck in our hair, and, and Glenn would play the guitar with a, with a spoon, which, which he always used from a, uh, for a slide since that night. Even on Black Choo Choo, he used a spoon. Huh. So, you know, it's just stuff like that. We just got started, and we had fun with it, so we just uh, got a reputation for it and kept doing it. Do you think that setup led to your albums having the different kind of genres represented in different styles all the time? Uh, I think a lot of that was normal evolution, but then in the early days, we didn't have any uh, theatrics that went with any songs in particular. Uh, it was just a free-for-all. And then we decided that we should uh, make things a little bit more coherent. So we had this early song called Nobody Likes Me, and Alice would sing, you know, like a little lonesome kid in his room, you know, and then we would answer him, oh, yes, we all like you, we like you a lot. So we thought of having Alice, we got this screen door and cut the screen out of the top window, and Alice would lean through the window and, and sing his part. So that was our very early theatrics. And then we had uh, a song called uh, Fields of Regret, which was an uh, early heavy song that we would end our shows with. That one, Alice took on a darker character, and that's the character that uh, led to the, the character that people know as Alice today. You kind of had that different sound for the first two albums, and then when Love It to Death came out, you kind of leaned more towards that darker sound. Was that, uh, was that just strictly like Bob Ezrin's doing, or was that something that you guys decided on? No, uh, Bob Ezrin deserves all the credit in the world, but, but people have a tendency to make it sound like uh, that we didn't do anything. And uh, After Pretties for You came out, it was very abstract, and we loved it, but... It didn't sell, so people didn't hear it, and it, and it couldn't keep us keep the band going. So uh, we decided that we were going to uh, write music that would be more relatable. And uh, Easy Action, we were pulled in the studio when we had like a third of the material. We weren't ready at all. We went in and kind of made, made that album up on the spot. But if we had had a rehearsal room and the proper amount of time to prepare for that album, it would have been a lot more like Love It to Death, uh, because that's the direction we were headed. We just got caught off guard midstream, not even midstream. We, we were really unprepared. But by the time Bob Ezrin saw us play at Max's Kansas City in New York City, uh, Michael had already written some great hits like, uh, you know, Caught in a Dream and 
and uh, I'm 18, and uh, you know we had we had uh, collaborated on songs too, but we had mostly Michael came up with the most you know relatable ones that people could could sink their teeth into. But by then we had already made big strides toward that. Now Bob Ezrin came in and he had the ability to really focus it. He had the ability to make sure that that uh, the song arrangement wasn't too long. I'm 18 was a long, sprawling song. I mean, it would have been an, uh, what they called an FM hit in those days. I know FM has changed a bit these days, a lot of the stations, but back then the long songs were FM and the, and the short, concise songs were AM. Well, we needed an AM hit, so Bob Ezrin took an FM arrangement and, and whittled it down to AM even though we still played it the other way on stage all the time. Yeah. Well, then when that uh, came out, I'm 18, and then you guys had a string of pretty successful albums, were you guys surprised that your popularity kind of shot up so quickly? Well, to tell the truth, we were surprised that our popularity didn't increase on Pretties For You, <laughs> 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 which uh, seems silly in, in hindsight, but uh, that's... That's true. We we thought we were going to set the world on fire with that album, and mm. and of course, you know, uh, we got reviews like uh, songs Walt Disney had sense enough to leave in the can, <laughs> 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 and and another favorite, uh, a tragic waste of vinyl. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I still love that album. There's still a lot of people out there that uh, that uh, love that album. It was big in uh, Russia because it was one of the few albums that managed to get into that country at the time. Uh, you know, it was it wasn't uh, allowed, but somehow people got a hold of uh, Pretties for You, and now that uh, communications have opened up. People tell me, you know, that was their link to the outside world of rock and roll. And I think, wow, that's a wow. that's an odd link. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a wow. lot of a lot of pressure to to be the to be their uh, idea of what the Western world is like. Yeah, well, we didn't know it at the time. I didn't find this out until maybe four years ago or so when the internet came into play and and then people could communicate. Back in those days, we had no idea, you know, that it was being played in Russia. We did work with Derek Taylor, though, uh, in the later years, who, uh, you know, did the PR for the Beatles. And uh, we had dinner with him in London, and I was sitting across from him, and he was telling me that he had just gotten back from Russia, and he said it was the weirdest thing ever because they had a big dinner for him, and all these Russian dignitaries were kind of interrogating him about what Sergeant Peppers meant. And he said, it's impossible to explain. He said, they thought that I was just trying to not tell them what it really meant. And he said, but he is trying as hard as he could to explain it. But he said, try to even explain it to somebody that understands English and everything. But, but I, I told him, I said, well, well just be happy you, they weren't asking you to explain pretties for you. <laughs> <laughs> when you guys were reaching your uh, popularity peak, I guess you could say, and there was a lot of obvious controversy surrounding the band with the different things you did on stage and that. Were, were you guys purposely looking for ways to, you know, make politicians and critics angry about those sort of things? Or was that something that you were just had bad luck with? Or uh, No, we, we really didn't intend to uh, make people as upset as they were. They just took it too seriously. We were just out bashing around having fun on stage and then people would read things into it you know and then and then it got to a point where everybody in the world was showing up to keep us from playing you know there'd be the fire marshals there'd be the humane society there'd be you know all kinds of organizations i remember one night actually i think it might have been uh it might have been in minnesota i have a key to the city <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh, we were uh, we were going to play there, and we were flying there. The mayor was on the plane, and we were, you know, talking to him and stuff and telling him, yeah, we're going to play in your city tonight. And he's like, oh, wow, well, that's great, because my daughter's coming to the concert, and she's a fan and everything. And so we showed up at the venue ready to go, tuned up and ready to go on. All of these people were there to stop us from performing. You can't do this. You can't do that. And uh, so it actually looked like they were going to prevent us from playing. And then 
the phone that was right on the wall backstage rang and somebody oh the mayor's on the phone and wants to talk to alice <laughs> and so the mayor is like oh yeah can my daughter come backstage and meet you well we're not going to play you know and he's like what so he talked to them and all of a sudden the seas parted and we could do anything we wanted that night <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> well can you elaborate on the muscle of love album or what happened with that and why you guys decided to break up well it's uh, the Muscle of Love album was our uh, return to being a, a band. Uh, we had, uh, uh, I don't know, it, it came about in not the best, you know, not everybody's always on their best behavior, especially during a time when we, we were actually just being driven right into the ground. We, we worked an uh, unbelievable amount. We were putting out two albums a year, plus we were the only band that was doing uh, a gigantic stage production. And we were still touring while we were trying to do the albums and while we were trying to create the next uh, new stage production. And, and it, you know, times, not everybody's always can stay on their best behavior uh, during those times. And so we had... Uh, beginning rehearsals to work on the Muscle of Love album, so we went up to Nimbus 9 up in Toronto, which was Jack Richardson's uh, studio that Bob Ezrin was affiliated with, and we had our first day of rehearsal, and we decided that we were going to uh, revive this uh, song that we had done many years ago. This reminds me a lot of the uh, Let It Be album, where the Beatles uh, you know, wanted to go back to just be in a band kind of a feel, you know? Yeah. And anyway, so we spent the afternoon working up this song that we had, and then Bob Ezrin showed up, and and uh, as always, you know, hey, great, cool, you know, we've got this new song we want to play for you and see what you think. And we started playing it, and we didn't even get past the intro, and Bob stopped us and started wanting to change it. We're like, change what? You didn't even hear the song yet. <laughs> Wait a minute, let us play it for you. And and he decided, well, no, I, I'm just telling you, I've got a, a something that'll make it better. And it turned into, uh, escalated quickly into a standoff between him and Michael Bruce. And, and so finally, uh, Bob said, well, I guess you don't need me. And Michael said, well, I guess we don't. And it was like just uh, a flare-up of temper kind of a thing, not even not even yelling, really. And, but uh, Bob got insulted and left. And so then we ended up uh, getting uh, Jack Richardson, who really, you know, deserves a lot of credit for uh, the production on Love It to Death and Killer because he was there and he was the... He was the boss. He was the guy that knew how to do hit records. Uh, Bob Ezrin was just a, a, a kid then, a genius kid. Uh, we called him the boy wonder, but, I mean, he was a kid. So, anyway, we, we didn't want to uh, lose uh, Bob, but there was some friction between him and Michael. And uh, at that point, we, we were kind of uh, too busy to really, you know, straighten it out, I guess, because we were still working like doing gigs most days of the week and still trying to concentrate on putting together our next uh, album. So, you know, it's kind of stuff like that uh, went down. And so we ended up doing uh, recording Muscle of Love at uh, Sunset Sound in Hollywood, California with uh, Jack Richardson and Jack Douglas, who did a lot, you know, the... Uh, Errol Smith, who's working with Errol Smith right now, he also worked uh, on most of John Lennon's solo albums. So, you know, it, it certainly wasn't a bad team. It was just a matter of uh, us trying to work while we were really needed uh, a rest. We were being driven right into the ground. So when you guys decided to uh, break up, you went on and did the Billion Dollar Babies band, is that right? Well... You know, we didn't really break up. Uh, we didn't. We didn't break up. We we decided that we wanted to take a break. And Michael had a bunch of love songs that he wanted to record. And uh, you know, when Michael would bring a song to the band, 
you know, it could be this great Paul McCartney kind of a melody and stuff, you know, and it would be a great love song that would probably be the biggest hit we ever did. But, you know, like Glenn Buxton used to say, we don't do girl songs. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it would turn into, you know, instead of I love you, it would turn into, you know, something zombies or whatever. <laughs> And uh, so he just wanted to record some of these songs that we couldn't use in our band, uh, which was understandable. And we thought, okay, perfect. Well, we want to we take a break because we can't keep going like this uh, physically and mentally. Uh, there was a lot of uh, tough things going on then. Uh, they had hired uh, bodyguards for Alice who treat, started treating us like outsiders. And uh, they were even uh, out and out mean to us. And it wasn't going over big. We were being driven out of our own band is, is how it felt. And, and so, you know, thing, things like that were going down. We never broke up. We, we did the Billion Dollar Babies album was to be the next Alice Cooper album. But at that time, we were being screened from Alice, uh, these bodyguards would wouldn't let us call his room and talk to him and and they would tell us he wasn't there when he was they wouldn't let us get in the same limousine with Alice it was it was uh, really nightmarish it was terrible really oh. and uh, and every time we would um, flare up over it we it would be reported to Alice that how can you work with these guys they're they're so unreasonable and Alice was so deep into the bottle that uh, he was, he was, I think, easily led. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot of bitterness built up because of these guys that were brought in that became a wedge to uh, simplify things for the next uh, big contract that was coming our way. And that contract is the one that most bands, if you make it that far and you're still popular, you can negotiate enough clout to actually make money. And we were sinking all of our money back into our stage show. And the way I looked at it is uh, that contract was going to allow us to do some big ideas that we never could afford to do. Now, uh, that's the other thing. I resent how it's always being said that uh, we refused to do theatrics and that we wanted to, to uh, split up the money and... and you know, that's that's so ridiculous. People, all they have to do is look at what the Billion Dollar Baby show was. We did four shows, and I thought it was the biggest production we had ever done. We had uh, these futuristic gladiators with uh, these guitars that had axe blades on them, before Gene Simmons, by the way. <laughs> and they And a big boxing ring would hydraulically roll out from underneath Neil's drum riser as these posts with red velvet ropes slowly would uh, uh, raise up and lock into position and then there was this clear plexiglass uh, guitar with a big axe blade and this nasty jagged headstock with a point that uh, could be driven into the, the stage and it would then this heavy thing would stand upright and then we did this, this song, The Battle Axe, and the gladiators would come out and have this big battle that was all uh, choreographed to our musical uh, background. And then uh, one gladiator would get the other one down and put his foot on his chest and go thumbs up or thumbs down to the audience, and of course it was thumbs down every night. And uh, then he'd get the, the real battle axe. They had these uh, mock-up battle axe for the, for the battle, and then... And then the light would go on the real battle axe, and, and the gladiator would go over and grab it and jam it into the other gladiator. It would actually go into this block of wood in the stage. And, it, and then smoke would roll out as this whole thing, the corner post would start to go down, and the whole thing would slowly roll back under Neil's uh, drum riser. And then all of a sudden, uh, confetti would come down, and Michael would run out with a, a popping a cork. Uh, and uh, in a white tuxedo. And why does that sound like Alice? Because it was supposed to be Alice. <laughs> it was our next album, but Alice, uh, we couldn't get a phone call through to him, and uh, 
you know, and so two people signed this big giant contract instead of uh, everybody that really deserved it. That's my story. Oh. But you guys are all on good terms now, right? I mean, you said you played at the... We always have been. We okay. always have been. I mean, I, mean, uh, I, I refuse to let uh, money come between friends, and if somebody else uh, does that, that doesn't mean that I'm going to as well. We never sued, even though we have contracts saying that we own the name. You guys have played together, too, recently. Is, is that right? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we played... Uh, a couple of times over the years, and then last December, on December 16th, we played at uh, Dodge Theater in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, to like the tune of 8,000 people or so, uh, the original band, and with um, uh, Steve Hunter playing guitar, uh, Glenn Buxton's parts, and, uh, and then uh, we found out, uh, just before we played that show, we found out that we were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So uh, then we uh, also had just finished recording three songs in New York City, Michael Bruce, Neil Smith, Bob Ezrin, Alice Cooper, and myself, uh, three songs that we wrote and collaborated with Alice uh, and recorded for his new album that will be coming out uh, in the fall, the Welcome to My Nightmare. Uh, so we had done that as well. That was that was great. I mean, that was just like uh, old times. We had a blast, and Bob Ezrin was great. You know, he's he really is the greatest producer ever. I I love the bass sound that he gets uh, as well as everything else. But I especially like working with him because he's open to our ideas, and and he's got tons of great ideas himself. Still, just like always. Uh, but anyway, so then we uh, rehearsed because we performed at the induction ceremony at the Grand Ballroom at the uh, uh, Waldorf Astoria in New York City, which was where the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony took place. No pressure there. You look out in the audience and who's sitting at the table? Uh, John Densmore, Bruce Springsteen, Michael Douglas. Michael J. Fox, everybody like that. <laughs> and you're going, oh, okay, this isn't your typical audience. <laughs> yeah, wow. What a, what a great day, though. I, I tell you, my feet didn't touch down for a few weeks after that day. Do you have some other projects in the works or anything else coming up? Oh, yeah, I have a lot of things coming up, but let me tell you about two other things that the Alice Cooper Group did. Okay. Uh, we played uh, the Nokia Theater in Los Angeles, and uh, Alice got the Golden Gods Award, and what a killer crowd that was. Now, uh, Jack Richardson's son, Garth, who's done plenty of uh, great classic albums, rock albums himself, including bands like Rage Against the Machine, he mixed the sound for us that night, which was killer, and it was loud, too. But uh, So we did that, and then the next day after that, we went to a film studio in, Lo in Hollywood and filmed us playing for these incredible uh, state-of-the-art cameras that they have, and everything had to be precise. They had to know exactly how tall each guy was. They had to know exactly where we were going to be standing at each time, and we did uh, six, six or eight songs, and we had to play them all perfect in a row because there couldn't be any edits. And, and the camera crew had to do, film everything perfect, and the sound crew had to do everything perfect. So we did two run-throughs and filmed a set that was projected at the Battersea Power Station in London, which is the building that's on the cover of the Pink Floyd's Animals uh, album cover with the pig hanging mm -hmm. between the stovepipes. And so we did a show there for Jägermeister, uh, and it was uh, uh, holographic. So we looked like we were on stage, but you didn't need the glasses to see it. It's, it was three-dimensional, but they called it 4D because when we threw the feathers, uh, they also dropped real feathers in the room and things like that. Wow. But uh, we did a performance there. Now, we did the very first 360-degree hologram with Salvador Dali in 1973. So now, all these years later, we did the first 4D projection live concert. That's crazy. That's like it, it was. Uh, 
people, people told me that uh, they had some technical problems uh, getting the projector set just right. So while the crowd was waiting for this concert to start, the Jägermeister people poured so much Jägermeister down everybody's throats that people were wobble-legged. Uh, I heard a couple of people say it was really funny watching people leave that concert that night because most people could barely walk. <laughs> And, and I also, but it worked because I heard uh, uh, several people say that they they didn't like Jägermeister before that, but they really like it now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But, but anyway, so um, uh, yeah, that that was uh, quite the thing. I I'm looking at a picture uh, that Salvador Dali signed for me uh, because I worked on this thing, this hologram that he did of Alice. Uh, in 1973. It's still in the Holographic uh, Hall of Fame Museum somewhere, Madrid, I think. But uh, uh, I worked with Dolly to help organize that. And it was great because Alice and I met in high school. I mean, we were like, uh, geez, what, 16. He was 15 and I was 16 when we met. And we were in art class together and we loved Salvador Dolly and all of the surrealist and and so uh, it was great that we uh, got to do that in our career, too. Uh, now, you ask me about things that I'm doing now. Uh, I'm working with Joe and Albert Bouchard, uh, the drummer and the bassist for uh, Blue Oyster Cult. And uh, we did a tour together in 1972, I believe. When the Alice Cooper group was headlining, we needed an opening act, and we played a festival, and Alice and I were out in the crowd, and, and they started playing. I said, let's get them. And I didn't find out until years later that uh, their career, they were ready to throw in the towel until we got them to go on that tour with us, and then <laughs> Blue Oyster Cult's popularity took off. So, yeah. uh, so that was great, too. But we've been friends all these years, but now we have a band. It's a trio, Blue Coop, we call it. Coop like a car, C O U P E, and uh, you can look up Blue Coop Band uh, on the internet. Uh, but anyway, so we do uh, uh, quite a, quite a few shows. So we do, you know, not only the hits of Blue Oyster Cult and Alice Cooper, but we will dig into the catalog a little bit. And we just released a an album called Tornado on the Tracks that Robbie Krieger of the Doors plays on. And we're working on a new CD that Robbie Krieger wrote a song for. Uh, we'll be doing a, a swing up to Canada soon. And we have a lot of fun. We, have, uh, lo we always have people sitting in. Like, we will be playing uh, up in uh, West Seneca uh, near Buffalo, New York. And Mike Marconi, who ended up being the guitar player in the Billion Dollar Babies for the Battle Axe album, is going to be sitting in with me. It's the first time we've played together since we did those shows I was talking about earlier with the, with the gladiators and everything. Uh, so then when we play up in Canada, we'll have a guitar player sitting in with us named Gord Lewis, who's from what's a uh, legendary punk band up in Canada called uh, Teenage Head. Okay. So, you know, we have a lot of stuff like that. We have Tish and Snooky from the Sick Folks who of uh, CBGB's fame. Everybody in New York knows Tish and Snooky. They're they're quite amazing. They have a company called Manic Panic that does all of the bright colored hair dyes, like for Cindy Lauper and and well, all kinds of people, yeah. Rihanna and uh, whatnot. My wife works with them, by the way. My wife is Cindy Dunaway, but Cindy Smith Dunaway because uh, her I married the drummer's sister. Her brother is Neil Smith of the original Alice oh, Cooper. Group. Okay, <laughs> and uh, and Cindy designed all of our our costumes. She actually people don't give her credit for it, but she's the one that did uh, what turned into glitter rock or glam rock. Uh, she did that before anybody. Uh, but anyway, so so I'm doing that. I'm writing uh, tons of songs, recording and and just having a lot of fun. Pretty much doing whatever I feel like doing, which uh, involves, because I'm near New York City, a lot of great musicians. I played a song on Steve Conti's new album. You know, Steve is with, uh, he was with the New York Dolls, and now he's with uh, Michael Monroe uh, with pretty much Hanoi Rocks, really. 
uh, and they just released a new album, but, uh, you know, stuff like that. So he calls me up and says, hey, you know, if you play on a song on my album, I'll play on a song on your album kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the answer is yes, because because he is great. He yeah. worked with Paul Simon and pretty much, you know, a lot of, a lot of notable work he's done. Yeah, it sounds like you're uh, pretty busy and have experienced a lot of pretty phenomenal things for sure. I've been lucky. Yeah, I've been lucky. It's, you know, I started playing bass in 1964, and I my bass is always out. It's, I mean, my dining room has amplifiers in it, and always has. You know, I don't care. You look in the room, and the room would look really nice, except one corner looks like, uh, you know, a rock club. And that's how it's always been. If some, if my daughters would bring friends over, you know, I'd hand them a guitar and we'd sit down and play. You know, that's. I still love playing bass. I better, I better stop by then. <laughs> I better yeah. stop by and we can play. Yeah, come on down. Now the bass that I have sitting here right now is the the brand new billion dollar bass that Fender has replicated my 1970 jazz. Whoa. Uh, in 1970, I. I was doing the um, Killer album, and uh, and my bass wasn't working right, so I sent a roadie out to rent a bass, and then by the time I got done renting it, the rental amount was more than the bass would have cost new, so it belonged to me. So the first thing I did is uh, I glued mirrors and rhinestones all over it, and, and then uh, I played it on pretty much every Alice Cooper album from uh, Killer on. And uh, anyway, so... Now, 40 years later, it's got all kinds of scratches and stuff, but they're all caused by me. It's been around the world, uh, you know, several times. So Paul Waller, who is the master craftsman at uh, the Fender Custom Shop, uh, is making exact replicas of my original bass. And uh, if you set it side by side, I had three of them, the original and two copies and I can tell, I can tell, I have to look close, but I can tell, but I've had several people who have worked with me for years that know my bass well that pick the wrong one as being the original <laughs> <laughs> when they're sitting side by side. That's, cool. I mean, wow. every scratch, It's the closer you, you look, the more amazing it is. Every scratch is duplicated. That's so, awesome. It's called the Billion Dollar Base, and you can uh, look it up on uh, the Fender Custom Shop. You can go to you could go to my uh, uh, Facebook page too and see it, or DennisDunway.com, my website, and see a picture of it, the replica. I played it at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Okay. What, what was the process like when they when they uh, replicated or whatever? Was it basically like here, give us your guitar for three months? And then we'll come up with something, or did they sit and like talk to you in depth? That, like, and how about like pickups or electronics? What, how how in depth did they get with you on that? Oh, okay. Well, this might be an interesting enough story, I guess. But I uh, I sent an email to Fender, and I told them that I had one of the most recognizable, unusual looking Fender basses in the history of rock, and you know, I figured I would honk a loud horn, otherwise I'd just end up in the delete uh, column with everybody else. <laughs> and uh, I told them that I wanted to play a replica billion-dollar bass at the Hall of Fame induction, and uh, that I wanted it to be uh, insured for a billion dollars, and I wanted it to have <laughs> real diamonds. And anyway, so they I got an email back, and they... Uh, flew me out to Arizona, and they flew all of eight people, the top guys from Fender, including the vice president. And so I'm in a room, just me, and all of these guys around this conference table. And I'm thinking, oh, brother, how did, <laughs> what am I going to say here? You know, me not being one, me being one to wing it rather than uh, prepare. But anyway, so... I took the base out of its case, and I just laid it right in the middle of this highly polished, big oval uh, conference table. And then I just leaned back in my chair, and I just stared at it for a while. And everybody's <laughs> looking at it, and it's all quiet. And then I said, gentlemen, the billion-dollar base. And <laughs> anyway, anyway, so I told them all my ideas for how to 
make a different version of it uh, that would be more marketable or whatever, you know, and save uh, uh, the uh, labor costs of whatever. And uh, two guys were quiet. And then finally one guy said, you know, I haven't said anything yet. I thought, oh, here we go, good cop, bad cop. (laughs) And he said, if I were a Dennis Dunaway fan, which I am, I would want to buy a base that looks exactly like this. You know, well, that's what they do. They, they copy things exact. They do Ingwe Malmsteen's or Jeff Beck's or uh, Eric Clapton's guitars exact, you know. So uh, that was no surprise. But So I left the bass with them because this was early December, and they uh, sent the bass to California, and there's pictures of this guy, Paul Waller, with my bass, with the neck off of it and stuff. And so then they got the bass back to me in Phoenix in time for me to play it at the uh, at that show with the original Alice Cooper group uh, in December that I talked about earlier. And uh, then, oh, man, they've been just unbelievably good to me ever since. I mean, they supplied the amplifiers for the Alice Cooper group rehearsals. They supplied the amplifiers, special amplifiers, too. Just upon my description, they made up a special bass amp with a silver grill cloth and 810 speakers, and they uh, supplied that at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. At the other two, all of the shows that I talked about earlier that the original band did, uh, Fender supplied uh, all of our amplifiers for it. So they've been... uh, I told them, I said, you know... I. I've been playing this Fender Jazz bass. Well, I have three of them, actually, that I bought in 1970. So guess which year I could afford equipment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I, I told them I've been playing it for all those years, and Fender has never really given me the time of day. And, and the vice president, Richard McDonald, said, well, that's changed. Anything you want, just let us know. No matter where you are or what time of day it is, we'll get it to you. Wow. So, and that's how it's been. It's uh, it's quite amazing, really. You know, it always works backwards. So, you know, when you're out on the road scrounging and you can't even afford a decent bass, which was me in the early days, I played some pretty crappy basses in the early days because uh, a lot of them got stolen out of hotel rooms back then, and and I'd have to just get whatever I could afford to get, uh, which always meant settling for some really cheap, you know, crappy bass. Uh, but then when you get to a point where you can afford to buy bases, then they give them to you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, that's awesome. Well, do you have any uh, final words for us before we let you go? Oh, well, hopefully, uh, you know, Blue Coop or the uh, the original Alice Cooper group will be able to get out your way and, and do some shows for you. Uh, please check out my uh, uh, the Blue Coop Tornado on the Tracks album. We... I uh, have a video on YouTube for a song called You Like Vampires, which uh, was up for a, a Grammy last year. It didn't win. but uh, And we will soon have a new uh, video coming out with a song that I sing lead on called Waiting for My Ship. And it's Blue Coop, C-O-U-P-E. And uh, I really appreciate talking to you guys. It's been fun. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been great for us too. We appreciate you letting us bother you. Oh, no bother at all. Not at all. Well, all right, man. Thanks a lot for joining us. Okay, Dustin and Ton, uh it's, hopefully we'll cross paths again sometime. All right, sounds great. All right, man. Have a good one. You too. Bye.